Howdy folks, Chris McLean back with yet another episode of the show and in the studio today I have Christy from Mumpower. They're Australia's leading marketing agency shaping brands that speak to mums. And 10 years young, they keep today's mums at the centre of the conversation to deliver brands what they call mum to mum advocacy. Um, that's why mid to large size baby, children, home, FMCG and family brands that need to reach Australian mums and their families choose Mum Power for consumer research insights, PR, influencer marketing, sampling and product reviews, all that good stuff. Mum Power is a brand force with influence. Christy, awesome to have you here. Sounds like you have fingers in all of the, uh, that, that was going to be a horrible sentence and I'll look like <laughs> it. Sounds like you, <laughs> you're doing a lot of things and, and helping mums in uh, all sorts of ways or helping brands that, that need to communicate and, and speak to mums in every channel possible by the sounds of it. Thanks, Chris, for having me, first of all. But yes, you, you are right. We work really closely with um, mum-centric brands and we really help them with their growth. And at the end of the day, we choose um, areas that we know is going to uh, make a, an impact to the, the brand advocacy that they have. Mm. Yeah, it's super interesting product suite that you've got. So not, a, not a lot of uh, people that I've spoken to on the show do get into the Know, in the sampling and product reviews and that sort of more traditional marketing research, um, quantitative kind of study kind of side of things. Is that something that you've always done or is that something that you just found a need to do? Um, I, I guess the, the mum market is it's a monster market and there's so many products, um, such a, a big ecosystem. Was that something that you found um, over time or was that something that you sort of started with at the beginning? Uh, it's it's not something that we started with in the beginning. So where we started and where we are now, nearly 12 years on, um, it is a little bit different. We've certainly grown from there. But where we have been in the past five years is that Mum Power is really research led. So what our core focus is, is to continuously keep our finger um, on the pulse of what matters to mum shoppers today and why she is or is not buying or engaging with certain brands and building relationships with them. So because we're always doing research into their shopper habits and trends and what she wants from brands, we use that research to create initiatives that are going to make the biggest impact to our brand partners. So if mm. we know that sampling is a great um, conversion strategy for companies or reviews is the number one thing that uh, makes a difference to mum's decision to buy. Well, we shape our products around what the data tells us. Mm -hmm. And do you do, um, is that really digital data led or is that literally stuff like focus groups and that more, I guess, tangible uh, sort of focus groups and that sort of one-on-one -on -one uh, sort of side, side of things. Do you, do you do both? Are you getting that data from other sources? Do you do that all yourself? It's quite an interesting uh, traditional space that not a lot of people really um, operate in that mm -hmm. much anymore. Uh, with us, Chris, it is um, primary research is our is the main source of our mm -hmm. data. So we've got a, um, a network of 20,000 mum shoppers who are involved in mm -hmm. our market research. So they're very, very engaged and active and love contributing to um, trends and, and buying predictions and so forth. So it is largely primary via our own network. We, of course, we layer that up and we see how that translates with other secondary trends and data sources out there as well. Um, and to answer your question, it's always uh, been quite traditional where we will do a mix of quantitative and qualitative. Um, understandably with COVID, that's shifted to be a lot more online, but we still enable that qualitative research so that we can get a nice rounded um, view of mum shopping habits. But where the benefit is with our uh, market research is that mum power will commission research on a quarterly basis because we want to stay on top of trends and buying predictions. But then it is actually a service that we offer to brands. So some brands will come to us um, for their own specific research um, project to understand what they need to do, what measures they need to take to compel more mums to choose their products. So the combination of the, of the research that we do for ourselves as well as for our brand partners mm -hmm. does um, enable us to be an authority in that space and um, yeah. lead lead our brand partners to growth. Mm. Yeah, that, that that's massive that you've got you've literally a, a research house too. That you're providing that that analysis and that data to all of the brands that 
that work with you. So is it, this has been a 12 year process or a 12 year journey up until now. Um, that's the, the world's changed a lot in that time. Technology's changed, platforms changed. Have mums changed a lot in that time or is it, is, does, is it fundamentally similar? Um, a brands, I guess brands maybe are becoming more tech based. What sort of changed from the, the mum's perspective over that decade and a bit now? Oh, Chris, there's been um, a monumental change. So when we started, we were largely uh, working with brands who spoke to Gen X mums. And, you know, after a couple of years of the business, and you've got to remember we started before Facebook, before Instagram had um, yeah. launched. Yeah. So we were dealing with a different type of mum who engage with brands in a slightly different way. Then the next generation of mums have been coming through. So it's now it's largely Gen Y mums. So the differences between Gen X and Gen Y was very, very different. So as a business um, who was representing brands, we had to adjust and get to know this new mum and what it was, what were her motivations were, how she was engaging with brands. And um, that was that was the biggest shift in the market that we had ever seen, that transition from Gen X to Gen Y mums. That was the number one big shift. And then the mm. second biggest shift that we've ever seen in the history of mum shopping habits in the 12 years that I've been um, with mum power and then beyond that is what happened with the pandemic. So the pandemic certainly um, flipped um, shopping habits on their head. And that has yeah. been a new um, process of, of adjustment and getting to know mums in today's world. So this, they're, they're mm. two biggest shifts over the um, our history that we have mm. adjusted to and navigated. Yeah, well, what, what was that? Maybe you can tell us, get into some of the maybe the characteristics or behaviours, consumption behaviours between that X and Y. The, the, the generational shifts are always super interesting to um, to get into. And as marketers, as agencies, we generally talk a lot about millennials because that's the you know, the generation sort of sweeping through now. But that X Y, that's sort of my my generation. Um, so yeah. what 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 were those key distinctions between X Y? Was it a, an analog to digital shift? Was it a, a mindset shift? What what really what were some of the key components that you found through through your research and working with particularly mum brands? Mm -hmm. I'll I'll comment on two very distinct um, differences because it really mm. did does has totally shaped um, how brands present themselves and engage with mums. Um, number one, the first biggest shift that we saw was that Gen X mums were a lot more loyal to a particular brand. So if a brand mm. was a market leader in the space, say for example, baby skincare, and they would have a whole range of the items in their their um, portfolio, being shampoo, conditioners, skincare treatments you know after um, care and so forth the gen x mum was a lot more um, likely to support that one particular brand but then what we were seeing with gen y was they were um, chopping and changing and they were making decisions based on individual SKUs. they were less brand loyal and they were more active in finding the right product that um, addressed her needs so she was not obsessed or as motivated to stick with the one size fits all or one particular brand just because it was good at one thing. So what we mm. saw was a really big shift in the brands who had the um, the pedestal as a market leader. So once upon a time, particular big brands dominated but then what we started to see was other brands that might have been a lot more boutique or they had a cult product they were really they, they basically took share from um one of the categories or a couple of the categories that mm. predominantly market leaders had so that yeah. was the first shift uh or the, the first um key difference and then the second one which was very interesting was um the their aesthetics, they were really interested in a different look and feel um, and how of the brand's branding and positioning. Like she really liked different colour schemes and aesthetics that were a lot, you know, more modern and polished and were an extension of other lifestyle products that she chose as well. So the aesthetics and her interest in um, modern and on-trend aesthetics certainly made a difference to 
um, how successful brands were in engaging with her because mm. sometimes a market, you know, there are market leaders who are doing very well with Gen X, but they were very disconnected with Gen Y because their aesthetics or their choice of language or how they connected with her on a branding perspective, which just was just off the mark. So that yeah, were the right. two key differences that I, I certainly noticed a lot um, between the two generations. Mm. Yeah, super interesting. What, what again? I mean, to to, to massively simplify now, it's a massive question. But do you think that was the mechanism behind that was social media, or definitely, or absolutely, the growth of the internet where Gen X was television, TV ads, longer term, deeper engagement, and then by Y, by Gen Y, you've got instant gratification, <laughs> instant notification. Um, more of a search mentality so you know your internet searching versus reading books that's a really that's a, a different whole different behavioral pattern and different psychology right having mm -hmm. to go deep into a book and versus flipping between tabs and getting that read that research um, and obviously the aesthetics of like an instagram and facebook and, and looking good for social media versus not having to do that was that was that do you think was that the driver behind those changes or one of the, the key drivers yes i would definitely say that that was a, a mm. core influencer because you know mm. with the rise of things like um you know instagram where everything is about aesthetics and what what look and feel and um what 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 was seen as like aspirational imagery that that you mm. were attracted mm. to that that certainly shaped um you know what people liked and the the because there was an emergence of more boutique brands that were able to address the aesthetics and being on trend and and um and give this generation of mums the look and feel that she loved she was attracted to um mm. it, it does um force others to step up in that space as well but yes to answer your question certainly mm. the digital era where we've got all these messages and images presented to us helped mums shape their own opinion of what they liked mm. A more discerning audience as well, right? Gen, Gen X and boomers, um, much less, so much less discerning. But because, I think because of that searchability and that kind of always on, and there's so many, you've been showing so many different types of things. It's a, again a different kind of psychographic approach to Ys and millennials and newer <coughs> generations are much more discerning because they have access to such a broad range of product and they can buy thousands of different things so you can really find this is the exact brand that resonates with me exactly versus there's five brands on the shelf and i just buy the one that's the cheapest and then that becomes my my go-to brand so i mean the, the whole ecosystem has shifted really as well like mm -hmm. imagine in sorry in you know in an industry like mum there's so such a variety of product um such a massive industry such a massive market that must be even more significant there Oh, look, it's it's very, very interesting because, you know, having been in this space for such a long time and having um, collaborated with hundreds and hundreds of different mm -hmm. brands, like there, there is no um, product category that hasn't been done before. So even the brands themselves know, like, they are competing against other like products. So because of that, you really have to be able to be it's, it's the brand that's most compelling that wins at the end of the day. So if by being compelling, you can connect with the mum by having that same look and feel that she's attracted to, that's going to enable you to um, uh, elevate the, the reason why she would choose you over somebody else is because it deepens her connection with you. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. We're talking about something, a similar idea just uh, before we jumped on air that people tend to buy like the marketing always comes down to human to human and people generally, if a product, if here's a talcum powder and here's a talcum powder and they're exactly the same functionality, I'm going to be attracted to it maybe because of the TikTok video that this brand did that was kind of cool and this one's a bit more Facebooky and stagnant or stale or old feeling. Like that becomes really, really important, right? When you've got kind of equivalent product the brand and that brand personality and how I see that and where I see that in the, the context of platform that I see that brand, all of this stuff starts to melt into how I make the decision to buy that this product over that one. Is that Does that play into um, how you help brands as well? Is that finding that positioning and finding that, as you talk about, finding that connection with a mum at that moment that wants a certain thing from a product? 
Uh, honestly, Chris, that's probably one of the um, key factors that mums will judge a brand on, and it won't even be the number one. So it could probably mm. be the the third or fourth, or mm. to be honest, some these days, because there's so many competitors, mums expect that to be a done deal. Like you should have your mm. branding on point now because the generation mm. has progressed. So um, what is more important now is um, the recommendation um, a product mm. has like for another mum to recommend a product to a mum that's that's mm. absolutely critical so that word of mouth is key yeah. and also um you know the first thing that mums will do before she makes a decision on, on the majority of products out there is she will jump online and have a look at the reviews so what people are saying about you and on what forums um makes mm. such a big difference on mum's decision and even if she doesn't know the mum well, obviously with reviews she doesn't know the mum but she respects mm. what other mums um uh, ha have to say about the product because mm. she can relate mm. to that mum as a user so that's that is probably yeah. more even more important because the branding um that should be by default it should be on point so if you mm. haven't got that right um that's kind of like your foundation your framework yeah 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 yes i think that's a really interesting point and, and super important as well that it always comes back still going to come back to how good the product is right if it looks beautiful and it works like shit, then no one's going people are going to buy it but that review you know that positive reviews can go exponentially one way but negative reviews can go exponentially the other so the product still has to be has to deliver on the value right the product still has to be good mm -hmm. So do, do you help on that side of things as well with your sort of testing and focus groups and and aside from the marketing, are you helping your, your clients make sure that their product is good as well as the branding? Is, is that something that you look at as well? Absolutely. So we work with companies that might be um, in product development phase and what they want to do right. is get a better idea on, um, you know, how they're tracking, like what, what it is about this product that resonates most with mums, what features and benefits have the most weight, um, what is a deal breaker or so forth. So we, we work with brands who want to get that right before um, their team put something together because, what's happened in the past and you know these companies are amazing companies they've got so much credibility credibility but um sometimes it's it's largely run by people who are not the not the users uh, or it's um being developed by people who are not the users so it's, it's more important than ever to test it with the mums or with their children to get the proper buy-in like i'll give you a small mm, example yeah. of how that market research makes a difference is um with uh drink bottles for or sippy cups for kids um where you know the color or how transparent it is you know uh, the the company wanted to produce it to be um a certain color but whereas the, the mum was concerned that she wouldn't be able to see how clean the, the water was on the inside or it was too hard to clean or it was too heavy for her child to carry so these um these features have, you have to get it right and that's what we work with the, with the brands we, we take the product to the market beforehand to get that feedback so that they can mm. um make it absolutely perfect when it comes um on shelf yeah well yeah it's super really cool that you're, you're mapping that user journey literally from the the design phase and it, it's, it's so interesting when you when you you you're the brand custodian and it's your thing and you go well this, like this is the material right this has to be this color it looks beautiful and then you test it and people go oh the rounded corners i don't like rounded corners or i don't like white because they say i, I want to see inside for, for something drink um, i might have this beautifully designed bottle that looks gorgeous but that's from the consumer perspective i don't care about that i care about seeing what's inside it and that's the kind of stuff that a lot of the times you just miss unless you're asking the customer <laughs> um so i think that that that's yeah. a really important point just as marketers and agencies in general to help your customers actually find if you want to find out what they want you've actually got to ask them right what do you want because mm -hmm. um, we can we can make assumptions we can do it get all the data and do all the um, sort of primary research but unless you're or secondary research i guess really unless you're actually asking that person what they want you can miss the boat some of the times because it, it can be a random thing that you never thought of because i'm not no, i'm not a mum so I'm not going to think in the same way. So that makes a lot of sense. Important point, I think, just in general for marketers. 
Mm. And and uh, what you ca- what we notice as well, it's something that we um, that's part of our process is is to craft the right message that while it matters to the brand, it has to resonate with the mums because sometimes there is a disconnect with what the company thinks is the most important mm. thing, but ultimately what the mums care about is a little bit different. So it's about crafting mm. that message and weighting your key messages according to what your audience cares about most. Mm-hmm. And it's so. Obviously, for you, that happens sort of at the pre-phase, the sort of research phase. Are you mapping that all the way through, literally iterating campaigns and getting the data on live campaigns and letting the market decide what they actually want to see? So you're following that all the way through that yes. user journey? Yes. We do, and it's and it can be independent, or it can be, um, you know, as part of a larger campaign. So we might work yeah. with a particular company purely for the market research or then um, independent of that, we'll work with a company that's already been there, done that, and they're ready to launch or they're ready to um, accelerate their growth. And we will work with them to get the word out to more mums and drive that brand advocacy. And even though they've got their their foundation and they've tested it and they know it's a a winner, which it is, uh, we still will tighten up the messaging to make sure that we're getting across what matters to the brand, but also what mums will engage with most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very, very cool. So it would be you, like the, sorry? I was just going to say, like, so we'll bring that through across with um, any of the, the influencer marketing activations that we do mm-hmm. or the product sampling and review programs that we do with the mums as well. So regardless of what the product is that we're supporting the company with, um, crafting the right message that um, mm. is a good fit between the brand and the mum is a core part of our processes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you you talked, uh, you mentioned influencer marketing. That was literally going to be my next question because I think particularly in this, this market that as you talked about that social uh, component of uh, you know, mums will decide based on that social proof of other mums. They'll even are they even more ready um, to make make decisions based on an influential mum, somebody that they're following, somebody that runs a a mums and bubs blog, or is a big Instagram figure. Um, how do you go about that? Finding the right influences. Are you connected into your own influencer network? Do you decide on somebody who's influential based on the specific brand? Um, do you just use mum influencers? Do you use influencers across the spectrum? How does that side of things work for you? Mm-hmm. Our influencer marketing is basically how we started the 12 years ago. So that yeah, right. we were certainly at the forefront when it came to being an agency that was on trend. That was what we specialised in from day dot. So we, from the very beginning, have, a, and we still do today, even more so than ever, a very proactive onboarding strategy to welcome more mum influencers into the mum power family. So we do have Australia's largest network of mum influencers, and we specialise more with micro influencers as opposed to influencers on a more celebrity status. So that's where our sweet spot is because we know with the micro influencers that they have such an amazing engagement with their readers who can relate to them and really do listen to um, what they have to say about products that they're they're using and so forth. Um, So influencer marketing, it is important uh, because it's mums are spending more time online they're very um connected you know on facebook on instagram and they the majority of mums will follow an influencer so it makes sense as part of the type the the different marketing sources that a brand engages with to reach more mums that you're working with influencers because it is one of the it's so much more popular like these days mums will not go and buy a magazine from the news agency the way she did a generation ago, but she will be on her phone um, to entertain, to inform, to gather information, to to connect with people. So for a brand, it is important to be working with mum influencers because they help the brand um, increase visibility and they will drive traction. um, So they will move the metrics as well. It's not the only thing a brand should do, uh, (laughs) but it's it's certainly a core activation that you cannot ignore. It Mm. it's just the way of the future. It's just it's it's the way of today, I should say. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a massive vote of confidence, right? If I'm going to get social proof from, I'm going going to look up a review from some random person that I've never met versus a person I've been I'm I'm engaged with and invested in, and I'm spending time and attention with daily. That's a much more powerful recommendation, right? Um, in terms of uh, platform, Chris, Chris, yeah. Uh, yeah, 
I was just going to say, you know, the sweet spot is doing both, working with the mum influencers mm. and working with everyday mum shoppers who will leave the review. Mm. And, of course, to answer your earlier question about how important, how, how do we you know, screen and select influencers, we have um, a massive three-part process in screening the right influencers to make sure that they are um, emotionally invested in the brand and it is a mm. product that they genuinely would use uh, because that authenticity set up yeah. in the beginning will make a uh, bigger difference to the quality uh, of content that they produce um, and share with other mums. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And yeah, that, that, that genuine authenticity of uh, I'm actually, I've used this product and I can genuinely talk about it. And you can you can always notice that with influencers where they can get in, there's a, they'll say something random that you would only know if you'd sort of use the product that always comes across much more authentically than yeah, someone that hasn't actually used it that's just vouching mm -hmm. for it and it's clearly just a more of a paid sponsorship type deal. Um, in terms of platform, are you seeing anything rising or falling in terms of particularly like influencer or with mums? Is, it, is there a shift to TikTok with younger generations? Is Instagram, I imagine that that's a powerhouse. Um, on Facebook, is it Facebook groups? Kind of where where is the, the attention in the space at the moment? And is there something, is there something coming um, that you see is sort of rising in terms of platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good question, Chris, and it's perfect timing because we're right now, um, we're about two weeks away from releasing our brand new market research insights and trends um, about mum shopper habits today. And one of the questions that we had um, looked at was what social media um, are they engaging with? Where, where are the new trends and, you know, what... what um, what plays the most um, the key role in her life and at the end of the day still across all generations Facebook and Instagram are still still the clear winners certainly there is growth a little bit with um, things like your, your Snapchat or TikTok but nothing compares at the moment um, to Instagram mm -hmm. and Facebook mm -hmm. not with Gen Gen Y and X mums not at the moment but mm -hmm. in 18 months that could be a very different picture mm -hmm. yeah I guess as I mean that th those Snapchat, um, TikTok, much more millennial, but like to, to generalize, mm -hmm. probably much more of a millennial type platform. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you, you, even you know, boomers, X, Y, that, that pair of ages, definitely much more face. They grow, we grew up with Facebook and Instagram. So that's where we, that makes sense that that's where they tend to be. But yeah, always interesting to see how these things adapt and how the attention shifts from platform to platform and how the, the the context of what you do and how you need to speak to people on those platform changes as well. So, yeah, interesting mm -hmm. to see how the, I guess, over the next I mean, millennials are rising in terms of I mean, moving into higher positions. Uh, what are millennials now? They'd be moving into their 20s and 30s now, I suppose. So they're starting to get into higher positions. They're probably starting mm -hmm. to... Um, turn out more kids as well so yeah do do you focus do you, do you sort of look at that that generational shift and are you looking at that millennial market as something that's obviously that's the the next wave are you focused on that or are you really just looking at kind of what's working now in that x and y sort of market no we're always looking um we're always looking in uh, in the future for like up to 18 months we, we look at you know long-term trends but also you know what what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis right now for the next mm -hmm. six to 12 months because it that's what well that's practically what we need to do we have to help brands yeah. fast track their growth in today's market yeah 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 six months is actionable we make an assumption and a hypothesis about three years from today <laughs> it's nice to know maybe and nice to have an insight but it's hard it's yeah, yeah. as you said not very practical, like actionable as this is what's happening in the next yeah, three mm -hmm. to six months. So yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you so much. Obviously, I'm not a mum and I don't operate in, uh, I don't have kids either. So I don't operate within this sphere, but it's I, it's a massive, massive um, industry. And there's, I know a lot of mums out there, they're avid about what they buy, wanting, obviously wanting the right product, wanting the right things um, for their kids and, and brands that are trying to leverage that market. Um, being able to have an influential source like yourself that's out there independently building that data and knowledge base for them. Um, yeah, massive. So thank you so much for dropping by. Re really, really insightful. Um, if people want to find out more about you, where are some of the best places for them to come and get connected? 
Uh, LinkedIn is a great point of call. I'd love to say hello to any brands there. And also we encourage you to check out mumpower.com.au or our Instagram account, mumpower underscore au. And you can see how we engage with mum shoppers, mum influencers and brands like yourself. Amazing. I'll drop all those notes, uh, links in the show notes as always. And when you do release uh, your new data set, we'll have to, uh, I'll include that in the show notes as well. So this will, this episode will probably will publish after that's been released so we'll need to stay in, in contact and we'll drop that in so we can find out the latest about where where mums are active where the attention is and how mum uh, brands can can best uh, leverage that attention and, and find that audience if, you, if you're happy you for so us much. to share, share that link out <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Well, they're free so long as you're part of our network, they are free insights. So thank you very much, Chris, for having me on the show. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to share how Mum Power um, fast tracks growth for other mum centric brands. Amazing. No, I love what you're doing. Sounds like it's super, super important and, and, and helping a lot of people out there. Has been very, very insightful for me and I'm sure for a lot of people listening at home. Uh, so glad we got to chat. Thanks, everyone, for listening at home. And thank you, Christy, so much for dropping by and sharing Mum Power with us. We'll uh, see you on the next episode. Thanks, everyone.